All right. Good looking guy, you have to say. I... Doesn't he? He looks kind of like a tough guy, doesn't he? Well, he was everything that his appearance suggests. Henry and Eliza Spaulding, Presbyterian missionaries to the Nez Perce down in the region of Idaho there. Many of you have traveled, of course, through that area. They were among the earliest to cross the Rocky Mountains. They came with the Whitmans along what eventually would become the Oregon Trail. Henry Spaulding was born in Bath, New York in 1803. Interestingly, this is a little bit of the soap opera piece of the story that I have to include because it plays a role in some other aspects of their life. Henry was acquainted with Narcissa, who became Narcissa Whitman, way back when they were both teenagers. They were in the same church, they were in the same school, and wouldn't you know it, at one point Henry proposed marriage to Narcissa, and she refused and he was not happy. And he resented her for many years to come. And one of the things he interestingly said on more than one occasion to people was, I will not go on a mission with Narcissa. I don't trust her judgment. <laughs> God has such a sense of humor. And the ironies dripping from this piece of the story I think will impress all of us. In any event, Henry uh, went to Western Reserve College, graduated in 1833. He thereupon matriculated to Lane Theological Seminary, bound to graduate in the class of 1837. But you may recall, it was 1831 or two, that time frame that our four Nez Perce friends showed up, and that did change everything. So before he had actually graduated from theological education, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions appointed Henry Spaulding to be a missionary to the Nez Perce. Meantime, Eliza Hart, born in Kensington, Connecticut. Her family moved to Oneida where she was introduced to Henry after the incident with Narcissa. They met briefly. They carried on a correspondence for about a year. They were pen pals till they finally had an opportunity to become more closely acquainted, the courtship began, and they realized that God had called them together. Eliza was as interested in missions as was Henry, and so they shared that particular interest in common. The only thing that Eliza had against her was that she was in very frail health. In some ways, when we talk about fractured pots, you know, we can think about sometimes personality failings, that sort of thing. That might be more the case of Henry. With Eliza, she was a perfectly lovely human being. There's not a bit of a fault you can find in her personality and her ethics and so on, but she was in very poor health and probably a very poor candidate to be a missionary. Nevertheless, they both believed God was calling them to this particular uh, um, life uh, vocation, and so they married on October 13th, 1833 in Hudson, New York. It wasn't long after that their mission began. Henry met Marcus in December of 1835. Marcus Whitman had already been out to the Northwest once, had been extraordinarily impressed with what appeared to be the precursors of a deeply Christian culture among the native tribes, and we're going to talk a lot more about that when we get to the story of Spokane Gary, but uh, he was in that brief encounter realizing that these people were for real, that there was something here that was remarkable, and he wanted to go back, but of course he wanted to go back with others who would participate with him in this mission. So he met, was impressed with Henry, and persuaded Henry to join him in this excursion to the Northwest in 1836. They took a steamship from Pittsburgh to Liberty, Missouri. They joined a, joined a fur trading uh, company, as we mentioned last week, and set off overland on May 25th. And as I mentioned last week, this is really regarded as the first official wagon train that launched from the east heading overland toward the northwest. Narcissa and Eliza were the first white women to ever make that overland trip. Everyone up until this point had been mountain men, you know, those types, and these were the first women from kind of the American East to make the journey. 
by June, Eliza was almost given up for dead. She immediately began to have health problems, and it did not appear as if she had any likely prospects of surviving this trip. She wrote in her own diary, we are now 2,800 miles from my dearest parents' home, expecting in a few days to begin descending the Rocky Mountains. Only God knows, only God who knows all things, knows whether my weak body will survive this undertaking. His will, not mine, be done. As it turns out, however, they did make it, and she was able to cling to her breath and life, and they arrived at the fur trader's rendezvous on July 6th. I've mentioned this several times. I think most of you know the mountain men of that time would have an annual gathering called a rendezvous. That was the name assigned by the French-Canadian mountain men, a rendezvous. And usually it was a time of rough and tumble, trading, uh, bickering, uh, contests, uh, drinking, and so on. You know, it, it could be pretty uh, uh, wild and woolly, as you can probably imagine. There were also a lot of natives who would show up, and some of the trading between the Native American uh, representation and the mountain men would take place, and they would last for about a month. So this was kind of the big annual event. And so the Spaldings and the Whitmans show up now on July 6th at this fur trader's rendezvous. They were all impressed when they met here in the Rocky Mountains at this rendezvous ven uh, venue, a large group of Nez Perce Indians who had come out from what we would call Idaho. They were there to meet the Spaldings and the Whitmans. This was an answer to their prayers. They had sent those four guys back earlier asking precisely for this, that missionaries would come and bring the white man's book of heaven or of life as they commonly called it. And so the Spaldings and the Whitmans were overwhelmed at the warmth of the reception that they received. Eliza Spaulding wrote in her diary, the women were not satisfied short of saluting Mrs. Whitman and myself with a kiss. All appear happy to see us. If permitted to reach their country and live among them, may our labors be blessed to their physical and spiritual good. Henry Spaulding himself was deeply impressed, but a little bit skeptical. He just couldn't quite believe it was as good as it seemed, you know, and he wrote a letter home from that rendezvous, including the following. He said, we expect to reach Fort Walla Walla, one word as he wrote it, uh, on the Columbia, the 1st of September. The Indians take great pains to teach us their language. Many of them can speak English, uh, English quite plain, better than I can. And they are truly a very interesting, pleasant race of Indians. He continued, however, it is said they observe prayers night and morning and keep the Sabbath, will not move camp on the Sabbath unless they are with white men and are obliged to. They are styled by the Northern men, the Canadians, Christian Indians, but we must not flatter ourselves. We must not forget that they are Indians. This is the first experience of cognitive dissonance that Henry Spaulding was going to have. Eventually, he would really come to believe that there was much more to it than window dressing. But at this point, he's still fairly skeptical. I'm going to develop for you separately later the reason you have an extraordinarily widespread and well-documented Christian practice among not only the Nez Perce, but the Cayuse, the Kootenays, the Coeur d'Alene's, uh, the Spokane's, was largely, probably if you could name one person responsible, it would be the name Chief Spokane Gary, who for, many, for some time was kind of an itinerant preacher to all of these folks and did put into place what was fundamentally a kind of simple Anglican form of worship that they all embraced. And to think that there wasn't something of genuine faith going on in anticipation of these missionaries I think would be naive. It's just too clear that something was happening that had that kind of impact. So that's why I'm so interested in Gary who we'll look at separately. But this was their first experience of this remarkable display of what by all appearances seemed to be a Christian practice among these folks. The two women, Narcissa and Eliza, were very different in their style. 
Narcissa Whitman was kind of vivacious. She was outgoing. She smiled easily. The pictures of her don't really tell the story. She was viewed as quite attractive. Of course, these were mountain men, so, you know. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, she, was, she was kind of out there, and, and it was kind of a, a humorous thing. The mountain men, of course, just fell all over themselves trying to impress her. Now, there was nothing inappropriate in this, but they were trying to impress her with their, you know, different mountain man kind of, uh, uh, you know, skills, horse riding, that kind of thing, and so on. And, and she was rather bemused by it and kind of enjoyed the attention and the entertainments and blandishments of these guys. On the other hand, Eliza was vastly more retiring. She did not like the limelight. She didn't like to be up front. And so she was rather quiet, but she formed almost an immediate bond with the Nez Perce women who had come there. And she especially began to take a deep interest in their language. And so she actually began to work with them and reduce to writing in a kind of phonetic way different Nez Perce words as she was trying diligently to master the language. This was very important because it became the foundation for one of the most important things that Henry would later do, which was to tran would not only reduce the Nez Perce language to writing, but then to translate the Gospel of Matthew into Nez Perce, and, and you can still find that Bible down at the Nez Perce uh, uh, visitor center there to this day. But anyway, uh, that was part of what she was doing very early, even while they were still at this rendezvous. She loved the Nez Perce at once, uh, William Gray, who I've mentioned, was along. He wrote in his journal, quote, Mrs. Spaulding, feeble as she was, seemed to be the favorite of the Indian women. Henry wrote in his journal, Oh, that I may soon be settled among them and master their language, so as to point them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So you can see this missionary impulse in both of them, even here at this early juncture in their lives together. Off they go from the rendezvous. They were led in good style by these Nez Perce Indians to guide them along the way. However, differences began to arise very early as the trip uh, unfolded. First of all, between the Nez Perce and the Cayuse, who were also there, and they were neighboring tribes. And of course, you know, eventually the Whitmans wound up with the Cayuse, but at this point, that decision had not yet been made. And so there was a bit of a contest going on between the Nez Perce and the Cayuse, who was going to get the missionaries, you know. And it was assumed that there would be one mission, and the question where it would be located was becoming something of a lively debate. And the debates began to spread to the missionaries themselves, so that Spalding and Whitman began to have a bit of a disagreement, sometimes a little bit sharp, as to where exactly would be the best place to establish this mission. And part of what complicated was that Henry was still nursing wounds, you know, a little bit, going clear back to his earlier experience with Narcissus. So that was always a little bit in play. Eliza was aware of all of this, and she was a peacekeeper par excellence. She was really very good at trying to keep everybody on the same page, and I think she had a huge kind of buffering effect at that time as they were traveling along. They reached Fort Walla Walla, which was a Hudson Bay Company post there, trading post, not a mission statement, uh, station, of course, but they reached it on August 30th. They continued their journey to Fort Vancouver on the coast. They resupplied, refreshed, and then came back. And by mutual agreement, the Spaldings settled their mission at the region of what we'd call Lapway. On November 29, 1836, the Whitmans settled at Wallapu, Washington, near what we would call Walla Walla. So they were separated by about 100 miles. The resolution of the conflict was have two missions, the Spaldings more or less with the Nez Perce, the Whitmans more or less with the uh, Cayuse. In the early days, they had a fair amount of success and progress. They built a simple log cabin. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore. The minor part of this cabin was the home for the Spaldings, but most of it was given over to a church and a school kind of uh, utility. Spaldings' early ministry was much